Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey there, Food Junkies listeners, Molly here. Today, Clarissa and I interview Dr. Bumi Abuaba. But before I tell you why you absolutely need to listen to this episode, I have a special announcement. Clarissa and I are officially launching a business together. Sweet Sobriety is a -a one-of-a-kind online coaching community and connection platform for those seeking an improved relationship with self, food, and body. While we're still in the process of developing all of our services, we're happy to share our Surviving the Holidays workshop with Bethany Mazaru that begins Wednesday, November 16th. In this very practical workshop, you will create your own personalized game plan for your upcoming holidays over four weeks. Learn what makes the holidays so challenging. Set your own intention. Make a detailed plan that works for you. Learn about self-care and integrate it into your plan. Learn about and plan your boundaries for the holidays. Leverage any food slips and glean learnings from your own post-holiday debrief to propel you forward. What you'll get? A sweet sobriety holiday plan template, guidance to completing your plan via four video modules to watch at your own pace, four one-hour live support sessions, one per week for those joining in November 2022. Register by going to sweetsobriety.ca or by checking the show notes for the website link. Now, here's why you need to listen to this episode. Dr. Bumi Abuaba is a food addiction coach who helps clients achieve a healthy relationship with food to meet long-term health goals. Dr. Bumi's work covers the full spectrum of disordered eating, including overeating, compulsive eating, emotional eating, and other associated patterns. She runs seven-day self-care retreats for clients suffering from food addiction and is the author of Craving Freedom, a book for those wanting to build a healthy relationship with food. In this episode, Bumi shares her personal and professional journey, her recovery journey in the beginning versus now, the book, Craving Freedom, how she works with clients, what she found helps her clients to be successful, what she has become more flexible around in treating food addiction, what she offers that's different from other food addiction professionals, what she's still working on, what's next, and our signature question. Welcome, Bumi. All right. Well, thank you, Bumi, for being here and joining us. I know you're in the UK, we're in North America, so timing is always really interesting. Would you introduce yourself for our listeners and share some of a bit about your personal and professional paths and how they led to where you are now. Okay, so yeah, so uh, I'm Bumi. I am a food addiction professional right now. I transitioned from dental surgery. I was a dental surgeon uh, for 35 years, but this is absolutely my passion. I, I, you know, it's just amazing, and it's through my own journey, and it's just something that I'm just so glad now that I'm I'm just helping like yourselves so many people just don't understand what they're struggling with and that's the most important thing so i'm going to go back and go back in sort of 30 odd years and my my i thought first of all it was it was alcohol (laughs) but when i really go back into you know really back into my history as i did you know my primary addiction was food but it was the alcohol that you know kicked off but before that i was very much kind of a latchkey kid as a, a child, my parents went to work full time. So I kind of let myself in, let myself, you know, out of the house, went to school, came home. And my first thing was my parents always left me food. So that when they came home, I was kind of hungry before dinner. So I'd always have like a little red and white flask of, you know, tomato soup and a sandwich and a little chocolate bar and I just remember that was that's something that I rushed home to to have and I do my homework and watch television but then you know there was the pantry <laughs> you know and it was the, the larder was full of food so it was kind of my comfort it was you know it was my go-to so bit by bit I was starting to go into the pantry and 
kind of sneak chocolate that was there because we had a big larder full of lots of food and biscuits and and my uh, original my pattern right from the get-go whether it was food or alcohol was hiding sneaking stealing but I didn't realize that until I actually got into recovery that you know it started from then and I was probably about the age of six or seven you know sneaking down and having a midnight feast and eating raw jelly you know uh, all of that and taking the peanut butter and eating it out of the jar and you know, oval tea, you know, that kind of thing. That's what I was doing. But then sort of when I got into my teens, it, it became alcohol. So, you know, my first Saturday job, you know, I gravitated towards people who kind of drank. And then so it, it was the alcohol that took off for many, many years. And seven rehabs later, it was awful. Yeah, it was, that was my journey. Really couldn't get sober for a long, long time just affected all areas of my life you know home professional the whole the whole shebang it was a bit of a crash you know car crash and finally god willing i, I got i got the message in the end you know uh you know i was willing to to not do it my way anymore you know i also i could do it my way oh i'm different i can do it my way but it was just an absolute car crash so 2008 um i came into proper recovery proper recovery and did a 12-step program and i just stuck with it but little did i know uh it was the the little food monster came up again and i was sober i was you know out from alcohol i was starting to get my life back into you know getting back the children everything it was an absolute you know it was a car crash there was lots and lots of consequences and i was sober right but then it was the food and bit by bit it was the old patterns again um you know the sneak and get sneaking food you know eating it in my bedroom put it in my drawers away from the kids and this mental obsession and then realizing you know a few months into my alcohol recovery that this is exactly the same thing and i actually that's when i twig this is this is an addictive pattern i'm doing it again but again i found it difficult to even stop that because i think it's always food anyway i'll get over it i'll get over it and i just found it very very difficult so again really admitting this that you know i've, I've got an issue with food now it's now food it was ferocious for, for nine months really really ferocious um the phenomenon of craving it, just the mental obsession feeling like a failure you know it just impacted again every area of my life you know so i realized it was a food addiction and eating just eating huge amounts of sugar and family-sized packs of lasagna and pies and and, and really scrub it down fortunately it was it was <laughs> I recognized it earlier, you know, so sort of within those few months, again, I just sought more help. And then I just really wanted to go for what, you know, what is this? What, what is this mental obsession? And really understanding kind of the neuroscience of it and, you know, the addiction cycle. It was starting to, the pennies were starting to drop then that, you know, there is a mental obsession and that's very different to craving that, you know, this is what I have. And, and I think that's when the struggle again stopped. That was another level of struggle. I stopped and just admitted that I was powerless again over over food and over certain foods and you know really take action with that I found also I was very much inclined to uh, so I got into food sobriety and um, a lot quicker than I did with alcohol <laughs> thank god and it was finding out about me it's kind of more of a journey of discovery self-discovery you know who am I why am I driven to do this I know there's, you know, there's a, a, you know, brain disease, it's an illness, and I can take responsibility as I did with alcohol. But then I started to kind of get curious about me, <laughs> you know, really get curious about myself and, you know, got all the help that I could have with that. And, you know, kind of mindset coach and, you know, looking at the holistic side of it. But the fundamentals was sticking to a good food plan, you know, within the day. I was very much, you know, alcohol really nearly robbed my life. You know, this is not going to happen with food. So I just stuck day by day. I stuck to what I had to do. And for me, it was a journey of discovery. And I thought, well, I just want to have, if this is going to be recovery, it's got to be fun. <laughs> I've got to have joy in my life again. You know, 
I, I don't want to be in recovery and it's boring because that's what I was really scared of, that I'm going to be boring or I'm going to be bored and life's going to be dull. So I started to kind of look at the, the things that I really wanted to do and just bit by bit started to look at things like the holistic. I love crystals, for instance. A friend guided me towards crystals because the doctors were saying, oh, you're going to have depression, so let's put you on Prozac. And I just knew, no, no, just let's forget that. Because that, again, is another slippery road. And uh, I thought, I want to get this joy back in my life. So I started to find hobbies and pastimes and, and things that kind of non-food related. And that I really enjoyed. So it was crystals and Reiki and all the things that helped me and, and giving me that kind of joy and that energy of joy back and that vitality and power of prayer and affirmations. And, and all of that was just for me part of my, my a really massive part of my recovery but the fundamentals was you know being able to have a sponsor to speak to somebody you know to really you know be honest you know because honesty is a very very big thing being able to be honest is so freeing you know it is it is the fundamental of recovery you know if you can't be honest with yourself you know and you can't be honest with somebody else one other person then you're in trouble and, and so that to me was really good that, you know, I had issues that come up in the day that I could, you know, talk to somebody and not rush to food, not rush to whatever. And what can I do if that person's not there? And again, prayer and distractions such as going for a walk or meditation, you know, all these things I really had to practice. I had to practice it and I had to practice it. And, you know, I'm somebody with alcohol that was all in. And with food, I was all in. And with recovery, I'm, I'm all in. You know, I'm an innie, innie, and not an outie, outie. There's no, you know, and I can't stress that enough that, you know, making that declaration to yourself that, you know, you are really worth recovery because so much comes out of it, you know, that it's not boring. It's not, you know, it's not kind of, oh, gosh, I'm going to, life's going to be so dull. You know, my life has turned around so much and I can do doing so much more. I can't believe the things that the energy that I have, the joy, the peace, you know, the freedom. And, you know, I'm just really proud of myself. <laughs> and, you know, I've got to do the most amazing things now that, you know, I never would have done because I was trapped in my head, you know, worrying about food and, you know, and hiding it and sneaking it and who would find out and the shame of it and not being able to look somebody in the eye and you know that's all changed because I've stuck to a very simple very simple plan and you know and, and getting out there and being honest so that was it and so I, I got to a, a stage where I was still practicing uh, dental surgery about 2017 and you know there were patients coming in with you know exactly what I'm suffering from at the time and I just thought I really I thought it was just a calling for me to, to transition you know so I took you know courses and recovery coaching really got into the food side of it because that is something that you know so millions and millions of people are suffering from and it's it's just so under the radar you know and especially when people say well it's food how can you you, you can't escape you know eating you know it, all of that so this was really something that I wanted to specialize in and when I talk to you know people at it in general family friends whatever it's kind of oh it's like a real epiphany it's like well, that's why I can't stop eating that's why I can't stop doing this that's why I feel like I'm using all my willpower you know and pennies were dropping with a lot of people I thought oh right this is really interesting uh so this is where I'm, I'm going to go so 2017 I kind of started to develop uh, program just very simple and then you know sort of, that was it I sort of just wanted to transition from there and uh, yeah dentistry is now I've still got my license as a dentist just in case you never know <laughs> but this is what I love doing just helping others who really you know didn't know what they were struggling from you know you know for years probably decades and you know anywhere I can help I, I will. Thank you so much for sharing that I could certainly relate I had my own you know struggles with alcohol and three treatment centers later and I really you know once I found food addiction recovery it was the same kind of mm. path it was much quicker transition because I already had yes. that recovery from alcohol and I will always wonder if I had addressed the food you know would the alcohol would I have kept going back to the alcohol if I 
you know, they had talked about the food in that treatment center. And that is another yeah. thing I'm really passionate about, hopefully getting alcohol drug treatment centers to address nutrition as well. I'm wondering if you could share well, a that's little very bit. important, actually. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head that that is, as you said, a lot of people's primary disease was food. So it is addressing it all together. I think, yeah, amazing, Clarissa. Yeah. 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 I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what it was like in your food addiction recovery when you first started. Like, what did you need to do all of the time to, you know, stay food sober? And how has that changed now? Because sometimes people feel like it's so intimidating in the beginning, all the work you have to do. And we like to let people know that it's going to be flexible over the time and that it's a chronic disease. So in the beginning, we need a little bit harder treatment. And like, what do you do for your food addiction recovery? today what do I do for mine is uh, I kind of hand it over I'm very much I still kind of do the get up in the morning and you know it's it's a prayer and it's my meditation I keep my rituals those are my non-negotiables yeah so these are the things that I do come hell or high water you know everything else is fine but it's the getting up in the morning and really preparing the food the night before because I'm a great one to go oh I'm in a rush or I've got to grab something and you know, it's almost like, you know, you're talking yourself into, you know, doing what you, you know, you'd love to do. You know, I love to do it at the time, which was just like just grabbing anything and then grabbing anything could be, I'm just going to grab something on the way to work. And, you know, all of that had to go, you know, I'm not grabbing things anymore. I don't have to grab, I can prepare and, you know, and eat mindfully and calmly. Um, so it's always kind of preparing things the night before. Uh, so I can get up, it's a prayer, meditation, food, three things I need to do for the day you know, three important things I need to do. I make sure my day is calm, as calm as possible. So I have time for my recovery, time to do my meditation. I'll do it a couple of times during the day. So the morning, I'll probably lunchtime, I'll just have a 10 minute, just 10 minutes, just to kind of calm and just be centered and make sure I go for my walk. That's another thing that I'd like to do. I always call somebody just to see how they are. Again, these are just things that I've, I've always kind of done in recovery and then just get on the rest of the day, but just be very mindful of the times that I eat um, because I don't want to kind of just slip into it's Again, it's mindlessness as well um, that we can slip into that very easily. And then there's the unconscious eating. So I'm very conscious of why I eat. I sit and I take my time. You know, the, the phone goes off, you know, and I enjoy my food. You know, I enjoy my food. I make sure I've got lovely spices in there. And it's, you know, it's, it's that's why I enjoy my food. So that's it. I, I've got to a stage that I've been, I think it, what I call a position of neutrality. So I actually, you know, if I walk down the shopping into a shop, you know, the supermarket you know and I walk past the pastries I've got to that point now in my recovery that it's not an issue that you know I can do that safely that I'm not almost gone into kind of unconscious let me buy that uh, etc whereas at the beginning there was lots of strategies um you know you trigger food you trigger environments all of that and it's it is important to really take recovery seriously you know that it's not a case of dabbling, but it's it's good, but you have to put the work in. That's not willpower. That's just putting in the work so that you don't have to use the willpower, which is what a lot of people, you know, who are struggling like with kind of yo-yo diet, that it's, it's oh, I've got to use willpower. I'm so determined. And, you know, I've got to that position now where I don't use willpower. I have to put the work in though. I have to put the work in. And, you know, I knew, I just knew myself that if I didn't, then I'll be off path. And just to say to anybody who's out there that really starting, you know, be as disciplined as you possibly can, but but also be very, very gentle. You know, you can be still very, very gentle, but it, this is not linear, that there may be times that, that you do slip and it's not to think oh my goodness you know how terrible I am it's you know what have I learned from this it's a learning it's a real journey of learning a journey of discovery uh, what are the things that trick you how can we circumnavigate them initially you know how do we create boundaries again I was somebody with no boundaries you know and that's what always triggered me you know boundaries with relationships or you know people pleasing all of that you know, and creating those boundaries bit by bit over the years. You know, if I ever had panics, you know, I had 
you know, particular techniques that I could use to calm myself down and, you know, this too shall pass. But, you know, a lot of somatic, you know, kind of techniques, breath work's very important and, and, and using those tools, even if I was fine, because I knew if I kept practicing them, that when the curve balls or something hit the fan, then I'd be able to do that or be able to pick up the phone to somebody or it just became automatic. So I am not, I am not trudging it. It's, it starts to become a flow and it's like, oh, hey, you know, and then the days seem to flow better and you automatically know what to do. And it, as I said, it's not linear, but if you really have that, you know, recovery is just beautiful and just knowing what your why is, your, you know, what, what do you want to achieve? And again, that's a very important thing. You know, where, you know, what is your destination? Where do you want to land in, say, five years time? What do you want to be doing? You know, health wise, you want to be running with your kids or, you know, being able to go hiking without being out of breath or just being able to sit on a plane seat without taking up two or, you know, even just just doing all the simple things in life, and then doing the and the all the big stuff that you know is impacted when you you just don't feel free in your head that you're preoccupied with food or preoccupied with all all the planning and the preparing and everything else and all that space that's now free to do some wonderful things. So it's looking at the you know looking at the big one, always having that in your in your mind. Yeah, and just getting all that into play. And it does sound like, oh, this that sounds like hard work, but honestly, it's really worth it. It's really, really worth it. But it's just to be gentle on yourself. Lots of self care, lots of self care. Lots of well, giving yourself a pat on the back. Yeah. But I think I think it is important to to point out like it is hard work because what we're dealing with is a disease that is biopsychosocial, spiritual in nature, right? So that it just infiltrates all these different facets of our life. And so okay. we have to really take inventory of what is happening in each one of those areas exactly. of our life and where yeah. do we need to, you know, have some treatment protocol essentially. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's mind, body, spirit, it's the whole thing. Um, and again, that for many, it's a real eye opener because I think it's very two dimensional, you know, and it's just about the way and it's just about the, you know, the food, but it goes way beyond that, you know, way beyond that. But as I said, this is a, you know, this is a hard disease. So you have to put that work in and, and it's, you know, what you want to put the hard work. So you're, you're going towards something, you're going, you know, away from pain, you know, or do you want to stay in that? You, you're just in the pain. Yeah. So when somebody says to me, oh, I don't think I can give up that chocolate bar or whatever, I just say, okay, let's see how you go for it. You know, see how it works out for you, you know, for a week and they come back and say, you know, in all honesty, yes, yeah, you're moving towards the pain, you're moving away from the pain, or just want to stay in the pain. So, you know, either or it's still, you know, it's still, it's still work to be done. So I'd rather be moving away from the pain towards joy mm. you know with that bit of hard work which becomes then automatic right and then it's not so hard it's, it's that not whole, so hard yeah absolutely it, there, it's like it's, going for a run isn't it when you go yeah. running and the first like 10 minutes is like oh, oh, oh then all of a sudden you kind of kick in and then you're flowing aren't you and then you're running and it's oh it's not too bad it's a bit like that <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden you, you, you stop or you look back and you're like, when did that, when did that get not so hard? Did, when did that get yeah. a bit easier? When did it yeah, actually yeah. start to feel natural? Like I don't yeah. have to think about it so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing all of that about your story and really how you got to where you were and like, like that aha and like this really sh big shift of like, I need to work with people. And I'm wondering then what inspired you to write Craving Freedom? Who's this book for? Is it for the professional or just anyone looking to get freedom from food obsession? Will you summarize the method, your R4 method? Can you yeah. just kind of give us a, well, yeah, a sound bite for that? Yeah. So the book, the book was for, I think it was for everybody really, for anyone who just wants to know a bit more about, you know, food addiction and, you know, other kind of eating disorders and just some simple just some just some, some little simple tips in there but also for the health professionals probably interested in maybe taking the course as well but I found when I was talking to people about food addiction and and sort of raising awareness that it was like a, oh it's like an aha moment so I was just talking to a friend of mine I thought well if I can just put something together that that's very simple to kind of much more simple to understand and then you know people would understand it more I think that'd be great 
And in the UK, food addiction is starting to, people are starting to kind of realise that there is, we've had a couple of uh, good documentaries, I think sort of 30 days with Dr. Zan and he's doing the 30 days of eating you know, junk food and what happens and talk about food addiction. And I just wanted to kind of raise that awareness in the education because it is the education that's really, really important that people don't know what they're struggling with. And once people start to know what they're struggling with, because it's like, it is the aha moment. It's like, right then, I'm not lazy. I'm not lacking in willpower. There is a way, there is a solution. And we'll take it. And again, it was, well, how do I start? And this is what I kind of go, right. Okay. Maybe some simple steps, just simple steps. And with, and they're talking to, uh, some clinicians. It's like, oh, we, we're, we're staying away from anything, you know. Oh, no. We, we, and that's always the, that's always the case when you hear things of eating disorders, you know, a lot of, professional healthcare professionals like oh we don't know what to do and it's a bit scary so I wanted to create something like a first responder type of course like you know and at least to get to recognize a little bit of education and okay I could do a little bit of support but then I'm gonna have to signpost them to a food addiction specialist or uh, an eating disorder a counsellor or Overeaters Anonymous, but maybe keep them in that safe space for a little bit until, you know, and again, it's about, and this is what, especially during the pandemic as well, that there were so many, we can't access, um, you know, a food addiction counsellor or psychotherapist or anything that was like one, one psychotherapist or one counsellor to 12, for mental health issues to 12,000 people. You know, I had a teacher in my course saying, I just, you know, I've got so many students or I've got an eating problem and there's definitely food addiction there and there's restriction and avoidance. Like, what do I do? And I said, I, you know, this is when I thought, let me just create something very simple. Yeah, very, very simple. So there's some simple steps which aren't linear, but it's like a guide. It's kind of, you know, you can go through those through steps with your clients. And as I said, just to keep them safe, but it's in that. So it's kind of first responder type course. It's your foundational uh giving awareness giving the education being able to do some simple things it may be the education that might you know be you know especially with kids it could be the you know prevention but again they've got then the the confidence then to kind of signpost um you know the client or the person off but they've got the confidence to be able to open that conversation to be able to talk about and educate and give some sort of steps so that's where the R4 came in so it was about relationship to food uh relationship to self then we're talking about reframing so very simple you know um, with the mental obsession again I'm, I'm really a big talker about the mental obsession calming the inner chatter uh weight is not related to worth so again bringing up self-worth issues and how to, to help someone you know in that in that stage so kind of the reframe and then the resilience coping mechanisms for you know uh, craving so very simple stuff you know craving mechanism skills then recovery is you know maintaining all of that you know maintaining a daily routine daily rituals what daily rituals can you use you know building something up simple steps with food planning keeping that very simple so that they've got at least a, a framework a structure a few things but as we know this is where we kind of step in <laughs> yeah and it's this almost is... like it's almost like having a paramedic right right they treat the wound and then they send you to someone who really treats the disease right absolutely absolutely and so now you're working with clients and you just launched a program can you tell us more about it what can people expect if they sign up to work with you? How do you work with clients and what's your approach? All right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's so many varied. questions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's quite varied. It depends on the client as well. But obviously a very, very detailed assessment, which, you know, may take two, two sessions, you know, to really ascertain, you know, what the, the client is struggling with and suffering from. And then really getting them straight into uh, the food planning. I think it's very important to get them in before there's any, because you know what we're like. <laughs> the head goes, oh, I'm not that bad. It's not that bad. No, I'll be all right. So it's really kind of going right, sort of deep launch into let's get the food planning. So I actually have um, a team now. So I have a food addiction nutritionist that helps. So we get the food plan together with the client. So we're on our merry way. And then we really do work on, there's a lot of shame and guilt, a lot 
a shame and guilt. Um, so we start to work on that. We really do though formalize the, the kind of the daily routine and the rituals quite quickly. So we get them into that, that framework. Um, so there's no, they need a focus, they need a focus. And then it just depends, but I have a team. So I have a nutritionist. I also more of a mindset coach as well. So they've got it's like a wraparound service for my, my, my clients and also I have a nervous coach expert as well. So we're looking at the, the trauma. Um, I'm, you know, not a qualified trauma therapist. And I do respect that people need so much more because there's so many things, the consequences, past traumas, histories, all of that, that can have a real knock-on effect on somebody's recovery. And I think we we know that, you know, trauma is very much you know, synonymous with addiction as well. So, you know, treating the client really with a wraparound service and coaching them through it's normally three months to six months. As we know, three months is when things start to, the brain starts to settle down and, and take them through there. So take them through that process. So it's daily check-ins with me, you know, you know, are we honest with our food plan? Making sure that the food plan's, you know, submitted to me and making it fun. So, you know, we're encouraging them to find the fun in their life, find the joy in their life, things that are non-food related. So again, it's self-discovery and there's no mistakes as in, you know, if you slip up, again, relapse prevention is a very big one. We've got holidays at the moment, big events, what do you do? And as I said, initially, you know, we talk through, you know, we talk through, I'm here, you know, you can call me, try and encourage my clients to go to some like Overeaters Anonymous as well. So they've got a wider, you know, group of people that they, they're like-minded. I have a, a group as well, a coaching group, which, you know, anybody can join. Um, if they're just, you know, one-to-one clients, they can join the group as well. So they're going to get that, that network going. So these are just, I've just started to formulate. That's been developed as, again, it's a journey for me. You know, what does good look like for my clients? And I just really want to, and some feedback as well. So I just want to be able to go, right, okay, this is a service that I can, you know, I can use. And I just like to have this team because it just seems to be working really, really well. And so, yeah, that's that's where I am at the moment. That's amazing. And I was so happy when I saw that you were advertising that you were running services for clients, that it wasn't just geared toward professionals now, because I thought that when, because I read your book and I thought that it laid it out really nicely. And I'm like, Hey, you're writing this for other professionals. Why are you not working with clients? But I mean, in a way, obviously hey, yeah, yeah. other professionals oh, no. are your clients, but then <laughs> why are you not coaching them? But then you started doing that. And I, I'm, I, I was just so happy to, to see that. And so I'm wondering now that you're working with like, people who are actually experiencing this. And I'm sure, you know, thinking about your own experience as well, like what have you found to be the most helpful to clients to remain on that path of recovery? Is there a specific tool? Is there some sort of mindset? Like what have you found to be helpful to clients who like are getting what they need and moving in the direction they want to be moving? For me, what works for me and has worked for the people is keep it in the day. Just keep it in the day. Just keep it as a 24 hour thing so that your head's not going, Oh my God, what am I going to do next week? You know, have an overall plan, but just keep it in the day and keep it as lovely as possible in the day. Do the best you can in the day. And that's all we can ask for. As you know that, you know, we are in the present, you know, and that's, that's what I always believe that you, you ground yourself in a particular day and, you know, meditation really does help with that. And yeah, intention setting in the morning or the night before, I'm going to have a fantastic day. This is what I'm going to do, you know, and it's planned out and that's it. But just keep it within the 24 hours. So do you do mindfulness skill building at all with clients then in order to kind of facilitate that? Or is it just like encouragement? No, mindfulness. Yeah, mindfulness. Oh, I do. Yeah, a lot of it. (laughs) It's so important, right? Because like you mentioned before, it's that autopilot we go on so easily. And then if we don't have that awareness or even that hypervigilance in the beginning to know, what am I feeling in this moment? What am I thinking? It's like, there's so much noise out there. We have no idea. And so we need those mindful moments scheduled throughout the day to just like a check-in, right? Otherwise, you become unconscious again, don't you? It's, yeah. You know, and it becomes the unconscious action, the unconscious eating. And you, you can slip into that so easily. So it is, that's why the keeping it in the day is very important. You know, the mindfulness within that day is, is so much better because of that. 
Yeah. Right. And that's exactly why I'm sure like you have had where we've had people say, I don't even know how this happened. I don't even know yeah. why I ate that thing. And this is exactly it, that lack of mindfulness in their program. So yeah. we're kind of wondering when you first launched this program, you said you're making a few modifications. What have you become maybe more flexible around and why have you made modifications to what you originally started with. We're always curious because we know, mm -hmm. you know, there's no one way to treat this food addiction. So what have you learned has been very beneficial and you've become a little bit more flexible around? I think, I think number one, I think, first of all, the modifications are, yes, more of the mindfulness, you know, which I introduced. I think that was really, really important, but it's not linear yet. And I think initially it sounded very linear to a lot of a lot of professionals, you know, if they do if they do X, Y, Z, da, 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 then this is what they'll get. No, this is a long term thing, and it's really espousing the fact that this is a, a life. It's a complete life change. It's a complete lifestyle change. It's a long term thing. This could be for years and years and years, and then just to realise that at the very beginning, that the person isn't just going to just you know, just recover. And many don't, unfortunately, as well as we know. So really getting the kind of setting the expectations and managing expectations uh, for the professionals. So really, really putting that right at the beginning that, uh, you know, you can't just go home gung ho and, you know, really listening to the client and really listening to the person and not setting your expectations on them. Yeah, that is so key, right? Is that we have to remember that just because something worked for us, if this is our personal story, whether we are the professional or we're a peer or we're a family member, whomever it may be, just because mm. it worked for us does not mean that it's going to work for somebody else. And yeah. you really have to just show up and listen to that person. Where are they at? Ask them what works for them. Support yeah. them in that. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Meet them where they're at. Yes. Yeah, and guide and I, them forward. Yes. And I think, I think that, you know, it's easy to fall into that trap of like, oh, I just know the answer. Like you said, do X, Y, Z, do this cookie cutter thing and all will be right in the world. And unfortunately, I don't know many things that it actually works right. like that. I mean, maybe outside of math, right? Like yeah. <laughs> math probably has some hard and fast rules or there are probably some hard and fast rules and like yeah. hard sciences. But yeah. when we're dealing with human beings, it just, it just isn't that way. Although, you know, this would be my like thing that I would want to just speak out to the universe, to anybody who's listening to this, that this works for us. Don't get sucked into the trap because as human beings, right, we show up and we say like, just tell me the answer. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Uh, and that's a very much diet culture, exactly. you know, whatever it's been trained into us it, from school, from our parents, from whatever organized, you know, a yeah. sports team, whatever it might be. And I think it's really easy to fall into that and like, oh, okay, I'll just tell you what to do. And then you'll do it. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> it's, it's really, really encouraging the client and the person to really tune in. What do, what do I need today? What do I need today to stay well? What Absolutely. Do I need? What yeah. do I need? And tuning in with that and also being okay with it because many mm -hmm. people just don't know how to tune in. So again, it's giving them the space to find that out. And, you know, and that's about also the creating boundaries as well. That's really important. And yeah, what do I need? And that's so lovely to know this is what I need today, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. I always think of that, that term self-care that I think it's thrown around and, and believe me, I'm guilty of using that term as well, but you know, I have an idea in my head as to what self-care is and I would really love for my clients to do it. But if I have a client that shows up and says, you know, self-care for me is actually doing the dishes or actually cleaning the toilet. And or that's not my idea, right. Or making that into, if that's not my idea of self-care, like I can't show up and say, no, that's wrong. That's just doing more chores or that's just more, right. We have to just listen and encourage and support in that and, and yeah. let them be on their path. And yeah, yeah they're not hurting themselves or others yeah. by doing those kinds of things for sure. Yeah. We have to kind of take ourselves away, yeah. you know, and, and the outcomes, the outcome, you can only just guide and be the quiet cheerleader. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm wondering because you, you have trained other professionals, you are working with clients. I know that you've taken the in fact course and you said that you've done some other recovery coach kind of training. What is it that you're offering that is different than what's out there? 
because I think we need to highlight your program. <laughs> well, with the with my one to ones, I'm very much onto energy medicine. So apart from all the things we've talked about, I'm very much a holistic board. So I work with energy and for me, and as I said, it's if that resonates with, you know, somebody when they've read my marketing or my sales or my whatever, if that resonates, then it, you know, it's really good because I love energy medicine. I love Reiki. I love uh, working with crystals and doing lots of other, actually there's, I'm not going to say anything just yet, but in September, I'm doing another training. For, but it's about energy medicine techniques. It's about kind of rewiring ourselves, um, getting our energy meridians or, you know, when you have acupuncture and reflexology and it's all about the meridians, the energy centers, the nine energy centers of the body. And when we're ill, they're not working well. And it's getting the those energy patterns to start working nicely. Chakras, again, chakra healing very important chakra balancing I love all of that and you know I also believe getting the energies right it makes things a little bit easier you know to 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 do you know life becomes a bit easier things become more acceptable so you know if there's work to be done it, it feels more joyful you've got more vitality obviously you know with, with all the work we're doing but underpinning that you know our energy our systems have to work really nicely and that's a fun thing they're fun things to do as well but that's something I'm going to be focusing more of as I, I go along yeah <laughs> it sounds like another great way to tune in to what you need yeah, right absolutely absolutely that's great I'm wondering you know as professionals in this field it's really our role to talk about recovery in reality and like model vulnerability so is there something in your food addiction journey right now that maybe you still struggle with or something you're just actively working on? I think my my biggest struggle, and it's always been that, but it's getting a lot, lot better, is self-worth. Yeah. And that's always feeling at the time just really mm, not worth it, not good enough. Again, you know, not not this enough, not that enough. And I can easily slip into that. So that's something that I have to work on. You know, if I meet other professionals, I sometimes feel a bit intimidated. I'm not as good or these are all the things that come into my head. And I have to kind of really challenge myself and go, you are as good. And, you know, da, da, da. And, it's, and it is very much, very much something that I've always suffered with, but it's lessened over time. And you know, the things that I've done in my life, you know, it's because I put that work in. Otherwise, I would have stayed kind of very shy and, oh, I'm not good enough. I can't, I'm not worthy to do this. I'm not worthy to be in this space. Yeah. You know, all those things kind of come up into, I'm an imposter, you know, I'm a fraud. And that's something that I work on virtually every day. You're so not alone. We, we have these same conversations and, and we have been in the field of mental health and addiction for a long time. And we still have those thoughts about it too. So, I mean, I think it's just so human of you and, yeah. and I, I just, I can just honor that. Yep. It comes up and we have to have our, our coping mechanisms to like, yeah talk it back down like <laughs> not today <laughs> today I'm doing this thing today I'm moving toward my vision whatever it might be yeah and, I call and, her Betty I call her ah. Betty so I have a little Betty <laughs> hello oh, Betty stop it and in fact I can laugh at it now whereas before it was like this overriding kind of paralyzing thing and I'm like oh Betty shut up go to sleep you know so I've made it funny Oh, I love that. I, the, when I use, when I use my GPS on my phone to get me anywhere, like when we were in Europe, <laughs> her name is Betty and I call her Betty the B word because she's often like, turn around, you've gone the wrong way. Or she, or she'll take you down or Clarissa calls her back alley, <laughs> Sally. She'll take us down the wrong way. Right. So I love it. I can so picture that. And <laughs> I just think that's amazing. That's brilliant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, exactly. So it's Bethy. <laughs> no, right. And I just, you know, again, I, I love that we can highlight that recovery can be fun. You know, we talk a lot about, or I talk a lot about, I don't know if Clarissa ever does this, but I know she's heard me say this, you know, a long, long, long time ago, one of my mentors said, listen, when people have the disease of addiction, it is like a Maserati, Lamborghini, Porsche, you know, you, you think of a really fast, flashy car and that's what addiction is driving 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour on the Audubon or out on the, you know, the 
the sands in the desert or whatever, where they do the land speed tests, right? It's fast, it's flashy, it gets you places and it's really exciting. And we show up and we're selling recovery, right? And we're selling this like beat up little whatever car and, <laughs> and, and it's not an easy sell, right? We're like, can you trade me in that Maserati and take this really kind of like <laughs> janky car? It'll get you where it needs to go. And yeah, so I think it is important to just highlight how fun it can be and it's okay to laugh and it's okay to let loose it a little is. bit and yeah. just get silly with people. Yeah. Again, with trusted others, get silly and just really show up and share where you're really at. Yeah. So uh I totally I, agree with you. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. yeah. So so I would have been um, doing this if there was no joy at the end of it. You right. Know? And along the way it would have been I like, could carried on drinking or carried on eating. Yep. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So I would love to ask what's next? What's next for you and the programs? Is there another book or do you have some like great vacation plan? I don't know. What's next? What's next? I think, <laughs> I think just enjoying being with family, to be honest. I've got two boys. I'm, I'm about to experience the empty nest. So I'm really just spending time and it's so good that again, in recovery, I could be present for them, their needs. My two boys, one's 21. Uh, James is 20, Theo's 21, and he's going to university in the next couple of months. So it's just really enjoying this time with them before they're both there and I'm home alone. So that's that's what I'm looking forward to. But what's lovely is, I mean, I've gone through all that emptiness grief, is, again, recovery's helped me just go, there's no poor me in it. It's like, okay, so, you know, what wonderful things. Again, it's just... It's, it's just the next step. It's just the next step of evolution. What am I going to do? What's going to change, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, I've got some ideas. Yeah, I'm going to be doing this training in September for kind of the energy medicine. So that, that's September time. And um, maybe set up a YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, these are ideas. <laughs> and there's daydream at the moment. <laughs> so where can our listeners find you? Okay. So it's www.thefoodaddictioncoach.co.uk. And you're on Facebook and I think links to- I'm on Facebook, yeah. yes. The Food Addiction Coach on Facebook and on Instagram, it's The Food Addiction Coach. Again, okay. on Twitter, it's the same. Awesome. Yeah, so it's the same all the way through. Yeah. Perfect. And we'll make sure all of that is in the show notes for sure. And I'm sure your website probably links- It's got all my, this. yeah, it's yep. got everything, everything there. If you want to contact me- you know, my, my email address is on there, but me at the food addiction coach. So, uh, you know, if anyone's struggling, please don't hesitate. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm before there. awesome. Yes. And again, like you guys listen, she's very responsive to her messages because <laughs> I just want to put that out there. Like you do, you get back to people. And I love that. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of time. You're very, no. you're very good about that. So yeah. Before you go, we have a signature question that we like to ask our guests. So if you could tell a younger version of yourself something about food addiction or food addiction recovery, what would it be? Well, food addiction, it wasn't my fault. I think there was a lot of blame. I used to blame myself, you know, how come I'm so weak and so, you know, not like everybody else. Why am I different? But it's a disease. So it's, you know, to say it's, it's not your fault and treat yourself gently. And with tell myself, my younger self, it, it didn't have to go through all the, the struggles of alcohol, etc. And um, was just to be willing, you know, it's all right to be willing to start. I love that. And I also love that you said recovery is fun. I'm in my joy, right? Because I think totally. that's... This we... is, this is the best time of my life honestly I'm in my late 50s and I wouldn't trade it for the world honestly I've I'm in such a fantastic time and this is so it's never too late as well ladies who you know in their 40s 50s 60s doesn't matter you know it's never too late to start recovering what a beautiful mm -hmm. message to leave us with thank Not you so welcome. much for your time you're welcome Thanks. thank you girls thank you bye everybody Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough. You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. 
Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>